Hey there, welcome to the Self Helpless Podcast. I'm Delaney Fisher and Kelsey Cook cannot be here today, unfortunately. She is still dealing with some family things. So I just want to take a moment to send her a lot of love right now. We do have an incredible guest on the show today. Nashima Gupta is an emerging Indian American television writer from Atlanta, Georgia. She was a writer for Huffington Post between 2015 to 2017. And after the success of her first article about her parents' divorce, she moved to Los Angeles and began developing her story for television. Her dream is to portray different experiences of her culture beyond what has been typically shown on screen and spark conversations within the South Asian community that have long been comfortable in the dark. And during this episode, Nashima shares her story about finding out about her parents' divorce three years after they were divorced while they were still living under the same roof, why they kept this information from her, how this has affected her view on marriage and relationships in general. We talk about trauma, Indian representation in the media, and basically how different types of love can look. As someone who has been raised to view divorce as I don't know, relatively common just within my own family and community. And the fact that my parents divorced when I was three. So having real, no memories of them together whatsoever and having parents and step parents and half siblings from a pretty young age, that was the norm for me. And I just learned so much from Nashima sharing her experience about how divorce can really just look so different amongst families and cultures and how people transition out of divorce how that transition can be so different for many different reasons. I'm just really grateful for her opening up about everything that she did today. So here's Nashima Gupta. Nashima, thank you so much for being here today. I'm thrilled to have you. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. So our wonderful producer, Humaira, put us in touch. She uh, discovered you and your story about your parents and she told us about it and we're like, yes, please, we must talk to her. So we're, we're really thrilled um, to have you. And unfortunately, Kelsey cannot be here, but I'm really looking forward to this conversation about being adult children of divorce. Um, but before we get into all of that, do you have a favorite or least favorite quote or perhaps many quotes that you would like to share with us? <laughs> um, I will, uh, I will save you. I, I have, uh, I've won, uh, okay. one, lucky one. Um, it's by Christopher Doyle. Um, and he says art is what artists make. So the process to become an artist is not to make art. And that's the journey as a person to get to a point where you are at ease with yourself where you are open to all possibilities, and then it will be rechanneled through you as an artist. So the process is actually the process of you, and the process is working on yourself. Mm, love that. When did when in your life did you find that quote, or what does that quote mean for you? I'm not gonna lie, I found it like ten minutes, <laughs> like ten minutes ago. <laughs> the honesty i mean <laughs> last minute quotable crushed it um you, you could have taken so much more credit for that you could have been like listen this was when i was 15 i was experienced <laughs> i was like nishima do you come up with this i was like i can't i can't do it <laughs> um, oh my gosh that is so funny within 10 it. minutes i relate to it so much um because <laughs> Um, because, um, you know, I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, now I'm like, I'm out in LA as a television writer and, um, you know, the, the project that I've been working on for several years now is about just my life and what I've gone through and my pain and my trauma. And, you know, it's, and I think that's kind of the most beautiful thing is like, it is sort of that process of working on yourself. And it's like, when you've gotten to a point where, you realize that you can sort of utilize and monetize your trauma and your yeah. pain um, yes. into something, you know, beautiful. that's what this like, show's all about, <laughs> baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's how self help is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. 
I love it. Is there, a, I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. Is there a quote that you were kind of too embarrassed to share that you like? I have a really ridiculous quote that I like found on Instagram three years ago. For some reason, it always puts me in a good headspace. Uh, Kelsey and Taylor hate this quote, the other hosts of the show. Um, but it's wake up beauty. It's time to beast. Dumbest quote ever, but gets me gets me so amped every time I hear it. So, um, yeah, quotes like that. Uh, okay, I mean, like, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know why everyone shits on live, laugh, love. I'm like, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, you just pick up, go to Ross, dress for less, pick up, exactly. you know, love, live, live, laugh, laugh, love, love on guys. the, live, laugh, the love. canvas. I love it. Put it, put it in every, every room of your home. Fantastic. Well, <laughs> thank you for admitting that you're a fan of that quote. Somebody's buying that shit. Now we know who. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I'm not even, I don't even, I'm not even embarrassed. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so let's get into the juicy shit, shall we? Um, so how did you find out about your parents' divorce? Obviously, this sparked an article. You worked for the Huffington Post for a while. What happened? Um, so essentially, it was my um, uh, September 2010. Um, so I had just started college. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I came home for a weekend. I came home literally it made no sense to me. I literally went to like one of the biggest party schools in the country. And like, I just was not about that life. So I would come home every weekend, like a good little girl. And like, uh, yeah. And this one weekend night, you know, I was at home and, um, my mom was in my room and we started to argue about like clothes or something like something very just, you know, um, just mundane and like just mother daughter. And, um, and it just somehow, and, you know, at that point I'm like 19 years old. I'm like filled with rage all the time. I'm just like a super angry, I'm just like a teenage brat. And so, um, you know, like the fight just sort of like really escalated to like where my dad came in and my dad was like, why are you guys yelling? Everyone calm down. And then it just got to like, and like, I don't know, I don't know if this is just like a thing that happens in like Indian families, but it's like, first it's like the parents will like yell at the kids and then somehow it'll like just turn into like the parents yelling at each other. And so like, you know, it's like my parents are yelling at each other and my mom just like, it just slipped out. And she was just like, I'm so like, I don't remember exactly what she said, but something along the lines of like, like, thank God I divorced you or something. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, And so, uh, yeah. And I just kind of went into like, I just went into like, I was just frozen and I had, I was like, literally had plans to go hang out with some friends, like like, you know, within like 20, 30 minutes from then. Um, and yeah. And like, after that, my entire life just like changed. So, um, wow. So what, what a way to find out. I mean, that is, uh, yeah, that that's a lot to take in, in a moment like that. And a, you know, a heated argument, how long had they been divorced prior to you finding that out? Um, they had officially filed for divorce at the beginning of 2008. So about three years. So they had been divorced for three years and you had no idea. Yeah. Well, so it's kind of weird because like when I was, when I was a sophomore in high school, um, that's kind of when, you know, like things at home were really bad. Um, my parents, they had separated for six months. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like, and, and I think, you know, I kind of like, I, I knew that there was something not like right happening. Um, and I, you know, at that point I was 15 years old and, um, and like, I even remember just like being 15, um, and just, I did everything I could to like save my parents' marriage, like everything I could. And it's like, you know, cause it's like you as a child, like you kind of start to think that, you know, I was like, cause for me, I was like, there's no way, like my parents could not, they could never do this to me. Like, they're just kidding, you know? And like when my parents separated for, when my parents had separated for six months, Um, you know, my mom had left and then she had come back and she had moved back into the house. And like, that's when I was like, oh, cool. Like, see, they fixed their issues. Like they're just being drama queens. Um, and you know, and then I, I had no idea that a couple months after her moving in that they had officially filed for it. Okay. So you mentioned that there were certain things that you kind of like took on the responsibility at some point of trying to save your parents' marriage do you remember certain things that you were either doing or saying, hoping it would save their relationship? 
Um, the biggest thing I kept saying to them repeatedly was that we're Indian and we don't do this. Um, wow. you know, I, I told them, I was like, like, this is not a part of our culture. Like this is not a part of our history. Um, you know, and also like, I, and I'm from Atlanta and, you know, and, um, like I've come from a community where, and a culture where everybody literally knows everyone. And so, at the time, I mean, I, I don't know if this is like true or not, but what felt like, like I was the only, I was like, I'm, I'm going to be the only Indian kid that has divorced parents. And like, it's embarrassing, you know? And, and I was like, I would tell my parents, like, what are you guys talking about? Like, I don't, I don't want step parents. Like, I just want a family. Like that's what a family is. It's the children, a mom and a dad, like that is what life is. And so I had these like very sort of like, it was very weird because my parents were not like, are not conservative people in any way. They raised me very liberal. Like, you know, they were very yeah. liberal with me growing up, kind of let me do whatever I wanted. And I don't really know like how I, I didn't really realize, like, even though I was exposed to so much at such a young age in terms of, um, you know, even growing up, like I, I, I never really felt like I fit in with the Indian community. Um, I, there, there was just always something about me. Like I just couldn't relate. Um, and so I always sort of had a very diverse group of friends growing up. So it never made sense. To, and I, I just, it's just so like kind of crazy for me to kind of look back and be like, where did these sort of like, these like self-imposed, like toxic beliefs come from where like, I was this like super conservative, like life has to be one way, you know? Interesting. And yeah. I think it was just a lot of it was also just my struggle with, um, um, with perfectionism. Um, you know, I just like, I kind of, I was like such a goody two shoes growing up that I was like, um, I guess you could call it like entitlement. Like I, I kind of thought that because I was always doing good and being a good person that like, I didn't deserve to go through any bullshit in my life. Cause I'm like, mm. I'm doing my due diligence here, you know? Mm. And mm. so like when my parents kind of like pulled the, like the rug out from underneath me, I was just like, what are you doing? Like, I didn't like, that's not a part of the plan. Right. Um, totally you know, out of your control. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Can you expand? You, you mentioned something that you didn't feel like you fit in with other Indian children or Indian friends. Can you explain, or the Indian community, can you explain what you mean by that and why you felt that was? I think, well, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, um, and my mom, like she'll still like, we'll still kind of joke around about this, but I remember like when I was little, um, you know, my mom would be like, Nishima, like, I don't ever see other Indian girls going to as many sleepovers as you do, or uh, Nishima, like, I don't see other Indian girls, like having all these friends over all the time, the way that you do. Um, and it was kind of true. Like I was kind of one of those kids where I did what I, and I guess that comes with being an only child, but I did whatever I wanted. And I think, uh, and I think my parents, especially my mom, um, I don't think my, my dad didn't never really cared so much. Um, it was always like my mom that was a little bit more like more of a traditionalist than my dad was. Um, but, uh, you know, like now me, me and my mom, actually, we had very recent conversations about this and, you know, I had to kind of make her understand that, you know, look, like I was such a lonely kid growing up. Like I didn't have siblings. Um, you know, all the, all the, all, the, all my cousins in my family, like they're all boys, you know, and it's like, they don't want to hang out with like the little girl niece and like, you know, and so mm -hmm. all I had were my friendships. And so, and that's, I just, and my house was so lonely because it was just me, my mom and my dad, yeah. you know? And so it's just like, and you know, now we like look back and now my mom understands like, I, yeah, like, of course I don't want to miss out on sleepovers. Like, I don't want to miss out on any of that good stuff that you're supposed to do as a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think just in Indian culture, it's like, we've, you know, we, we've grown up in such a strict traditional culture where it's like, I don't know, like our parents just kind of go off of, I, I will never, I don't understand like the Indian parenting process. Um, and now I look back and I'm like very, very thankful and lucky for who mine were um, and who mine are. Um, but yeah, I just, um, I don't know. I think I just, I was just exposed to so many different types of cultures at such a young age that I was like, I do not relate to my own. Mm. Um, you know, cause I think a lot of it too, is because a, a lot of the other Indian kids, they were growing up in very strict households. And so I was like, 
yeah, I don't know how to hang out with you. Like, I don't know what, what do we talk about? (laughs) Um, yeah. Okay. And so were your parents still living under the same roof, even though they were divorced for three years? Yeah. So my parents got divorced. Yeah. So my parents got divorced, I believe April, 2008. Uh, and they, we still lived in the same house. Um, like I had no idea. Um, and then, yeah. And then even after the divorce, we still lived in the same. I mean, I was in college, but I came home every weekend. Um, but my parents still lived in the same house. Like my mom didn't move out of the house until 2013. Um, so yeah, wow. so like six years being with your divorced parents in the same roof. It's like real fun. <laughs> that is so fascinating. It just, I mean, divorce is very prevalent in between, you know, my family, I would say maybe at least 50% of my family have been divorced. So in my, you know, in my experience, it's almost like a running joke in a way where it's like, look, you only get married twice. And Hey, yeah. you know, Hey, that wedding dress is more of a second wedding uh, energy that you're giving You know, it's like, it's almost like become the butt of a joke in a way because it's so prevalent. And anybody I know who have, who has been divorced, it's usually like they move out, they move out even before the divorce happens. And then the divorce is finalized or it's finalized. They, they don't want to be anywhere near each other. I mean, first of all, was there a reason they, they stayed in under the same roof and how, how did that work? It's actually kind of, and I I feel like what I'm about to say, I think it actually plays a lot into kind of the way that we're sort of seeing like the direction of this country right now, um, is my, my dad and my mom, um, even though the marriage was not working out, they both very heavily believe in a nuclear family system. Mm. And, you know, so, and when I asked my parents, like, why, why did you not tell me? Um, and you know, my, my dad was like, well, Nishima, like you have to think about it. You were 16 years old. Like you were, you know, starting your junior year, um, or like, it was like halfway through my junior year of, of high school. He was like, you needed to study for the SATs. You were figuring out what college you wanted to go to. You know, I was like elected class president for junior year. I was like elected class president for senior year. My dad was like, who were we, like, who were me and your mom to take away that happiness from you? Like, Mm -hmm. they were like a 16 year old should not know, like, he was like, you should not know, like, we didn't want you to know that kind of pain that early because we didn't want to screw up your life, mm-hmm. you know? And so like, that's what my dad was like. So even though I kind of found out in college, like, I guess my parents just sort of believed that I would be a little bit more emotionally mature to handle it. Um, okay. which I was like, no, you're completely wrong. Cause you ruined my entire college experience, but it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, but in a way it's like my, and I think I don't know. I think that's just kind of a lot of, um, I think that just, it kind of what comes with being an immigrant, you know, it's like your are like family, family first over everything, um, regardless of what's broken. It's just like family first. Um, okay. and you know, and I think even with my mom and my dad, um, you know, my mom, like she was, I mean, my mom was like pretty much a housewife for a lot of her life. Um, you know, she had had jobs here and there, but you know, it was going to take her some time to kind of like get back on her feet. And, you know, my dad, they just, it was never going to be one of those things where one or the other was going to like kick the other one out of the house, you know, like that just was not a thing. So I think my parents, they both kind of waited until, um, like I was at an older age, um, to where I could handle it. And, you know, cause that's what my dad, he was like, you're in college now. Like he was like, Nishima, like, I trust me. Like I know it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders right now, but like, give it five years. You're not even going to care that me and your mom are divorced. And, you know, and he was right. Now I look back and I'm like, oh, wow, you actually gave me like the biggest blessing of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, now I'm like, I'm like, I actually weirdly, I'm like, I am one of like the lucky ones as like an Indian kid whose parents like made the right choice and like completely like shifted the way that I want to live my life. Um, So Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know, it's like kind of ironic too, because going back to just um, like, you know, my mom sort of complaining about all these sleep, but like, I remember I like told my mom, I was like, I was like, mom, you cannot complain about me going to like my friend Samantha's house to have a sleepover when like you and dad just did the most like American thing in the world. Like, you know, I'm like <laughs> me going to a sleepover, like chill, you're good. Um <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, it's like you just can't, you cannot complain about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it correct to assume that your parents were coming more from a place of wanting to protect you during this time versus they were ashamed of that decision? Um, or was it so both? This think? is, I think it, it may have been a little bit of both. I'm, I'm still like, because when I, like before my parents had officially filed for divorce, our extended family knew that my parents were having marital issues. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I think, man, and I like, I look back at it now and I'm just like, I am like, what a like, just, I, so when I was 15 years old, um, and my parents, they hadn't been divorced. They were, they were separating. Um, and I remember it was like my Christmas break of my sophomore year of high school and, um, things were really, really bad. Um, I ended up leaving my house for a month to live with my cousins, uh, cause I did not want to be home. Um, and I remember there was one night where all of our extended family came over, um, and my parents were not there and I was like sitting in the living room. And I just remember it's like me sitting in the middle and it's like all my aunts sitting around me and my uncles are sitting at the kitchen table and they're all essentially talking about how my mom is not going to be capable of being alone. So it's like, I hear my uncles on one side talking about how my mom does not have the ability to be independent. And then I have my aunts around me telling me like, Nishima, you have to fix their marriage. Like you have to. Oh so God. it's like, you know, so yeah. Um, so much so, pressure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and so it, it's, uh, yeah. So I think, I think, you know, when my parents got divorced, um, I mean, they, they had to keep quiet because I think also like, I don't think they wanted like what happens if someone came and told me, um, you know? Right. And so, and then I think like, after I found out that was sort of when I think my parents just kind of, they just kind of stopped caring and they were like, okay, like now the cat's at like the most important person that needed to know knows now, you know? And so I think after that, it was sort of, I mean, for, for me, obviously it was like just the most traumatizing experience, but like for my parents, it was like such a relief that it's like finally out you know, mm -hmm. um, because it was like, after that, there was just such a change in my house. Like it was very clear after that, that like, Oh yeah, Nishima, your parents are divorced. Like they're not sleeping in separate rooms because, you know, cause my, most of my life, my mom always told me that, uh, she sleeps in a different room than my dad because she has, she suffers from insomnia and she didn't want to like bother my dad, um, before he like needed to, to go to work and stuff. And I just, I believed it. But now I'm like, oh, like, this is why you guys sleep in different rooms. Like you guys have yeah. been lying to me for a very long time about this. Um, and so, yeah, so it was like very just sort of, um, you know, like all of a sudden it was like, I found out and then my parents were like, okay, great. Now we can officially live our separate lives. Um, so like we still lived in the same house, but like my parents just, my dad did his thing. My mom did her thing. Weirdly, my dad would still take care of the bills. There was still dinner on the table every night for my dad. Like they still like took care of just like their basic needs for one another. Yeah. But there was no, um, there was no like love affection or yeah, there was no yeah. affection. There was none of that. Wow. Was there a noticeable shift once you knew, like, were they, um, how they were kind of acting in front of each other when they were maybe still keeping up that they were married for your sake versus oh. when they knew, was there a big change? The way that they were acting after I found out, I realized was it's actually, it was the exact same way they were acting after they were divorced. Uh, or like, wow. and yeah. And I think I just, I just didn't know. Um, and, and it was, I mean, it was very confusing for me because you know, like in the Indian community, you're always going to like someone's house for dinner. You're always going to like a wedding or a party or something every weekend. And we would still all go together as a family. And so, you know, it's like, I just didn't know anything. Um, and so my parents, I mean, yeah, they, uh, they, they did put on one hell of a facade. So, um, yeah, it was, it's, I, I don't know. It's just so, and I'm still like, I don't know, like a lot of that time it, it, I, I kind of just have like little like splurts of remembering stuff, but I mean, mm. I think what I remember the most is, um, you know, my, uh, and I, and, and I feel like a lot of this plays into just like my adulthood, but, um, you know, my, my relationship with my mom, it suffered tremendously, um, because, you know, my mom is the one that left. Um, so it was like my dad who had to be my mom and my dad at the exact same time. You know, it's like my dad is the one who like 
threw me like a gigantic sweet 16 party, like the sweet 16 of my dreams, you know? Um, and my mom was not there. Um, and so a lot of growing up, especially into my twenties, um, I felt very abandoned by my mom. Um, and I started to hold a lot of resentment towards her. Um, you know, I think I don't, it wasn't until I think 2019 where we actually like really repaired our relationship. Um, and so it's like very recently that like, you know, it's been about like almost like two years now that me and my mom, I actually like, I'm like, okay, like, I I feel like I have a mom now, you know? Um, so it's like my relationship with my dad, I mean, like me and my dad are like this. Um, and so, yeah. Cause I mean, he was just like, it's like, I, I when I kind of look back and I know my mom holds like a lot of regret as well, but you know, when I look back into like the most important moments of my life as like a 20 something, like moving into like my first college apartment off campus and like driving me to college, like all those things, it's, um, you know, it was, it was my dad. Um, it was mm-hmm. not my mom. So, you know, so it's like, that was like also like really, really hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you saying that your mom was the one who left, meaning she left the home to live somewhere else and you stayed in that home or did she leave your life for a period of time? (laughs) Um, yeah, I mean, you know, so when I was, um, after they, so before they had officially filed for divorce, um, the year prior, my mom and my dad had separated for about, um, like they had separated for about six months. Yeah. It was like March to October. Um, and my mom just, um, I remember this. I went to Miami for spring break to go visit my cousin. And literally, like as soon as I landed, I called my mom to tell her that I had landed. And um, I could tell that she was like at the airport. And I was like, where are you? Um, And that's when she told me she was leaving. Um, And so she didn't, I think she just like didn't, I I don't know if this is true. Actually, we we actually never, we've never talked about it. Um, But Mm. Uh, I, I kind of have held this belief that she was just waiting for me to leave for spring break. So I wouldn't have to like see her leave. And so, um, yeah. And so I came back and my mom was gone. So I keep thinking about that moment where you're, you kind of like circled around with all of your aunts at this table saying you have to save your parents' marriage and all of that. And hearing the other table saying that your mom would not be able to, you know, provide for herself or she couldn't be on her own. I'd imagine as a young woman that greatly affected you in a lot of ways, obviously, but is there a certain amount of pressure you're putting on yourself now to be a super independent, to to kind of keep your autonomy if you ever needed to leave an unhappy situation or relationship? Uh, Yes, yes, Mm -hmm. yes. And yes. Um, I, um, and I think I, well, I don't know if a lot of it, I, I mean, I do think part of it is because of my mom. Um, but I think a lot of it is just because of like sort of the values that my dad has instilled in me as like Mm -hmm. an only child and a daughter of, you know, my dad, like, you know, my dad's sort of my dad's motto for his whole life is like, I will like, you know, he's like, I will like help people. I will give them money if they need it, whatever, but I will never ask anyone for money, you know? And like, that's sort of like that value that he's instilled in me is like Nishima, like, you got to be on your own two feet, you know? Mm. Um, and so, yeah. And I think a lot of it too is, you know, after, um, this is like kind of fast forwarding a little bit, but, um, you know, after my parents had gotten divorced, um, about like halfway through college, um, you know, my mom, uh, she started to get like very ironically, very involved with the Indian community, um, and was like a part of all of these like large organizations, like, my mom is like definitely one of those. And I know this is where I get it from, but like my mom is like one of those people where she like needs to see her name in flashing lights. Like she wants that like recognition. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and she wants to be known for like just the good that she does for like just the good that she always wants to put out in the world. And a lot of that independence, I can, t- I, I, I'm like, that is, I can tell a hundred percent. That's where I've gotten it from. Mm-hmm. Um, you know? And so, yeah. So I think a lot of, I mean, a lot of, and I, and I think again, because I've spent, I feel like emotionally I've spent so much of my twenties by myself. Um, I kind of, I'm like, okay, Nishima, like you have to be this like super, like you have to look out for yourself. Um, so yeah. So it's been a little tricky because I'm like trying to like balance that sort of like 
that like level of independency, but also just kind of, you know, now that I'm like 28 and like, you know, getting into this point in my life where it's like, I'm looking for like a life partner. It's like, okay, but how do you make sure that you're not being like too independent in your relationships? And like, you know, like also right. knowing how to like receive when someone wants to give you to, like to give to you, you know? Um, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough balance. I know that I, um, I took a lot of that pressure on just from, you know, things in my childhood that I need to be able to provide for myself no matter what, even if I'm married, have a separate bank account and separate, always have my own money. Like that was instilled in me from such a young age being told that, but also being seen, being shown that in a lot of ways. So like you never want to feel trapped um, you know, because you're relying on somebody to financially support you. So you've mentioned that, you know, your parents were a little bit, uh, the way that they raised you or their parenting style was different than maybe, um, like, you know, typical Indian culture. Can you kind of speak to that? Because even you as a kid saying to your parents, we don't do this, we're Indian. Can you share, what does that mean? What does that usually look like? It was that like, okay, like, no, we figure our shit out within the walls of this home. Like you don't just get up and abandon your own family. Mm. Um, like you just, that's, uh, that's like, no, there's like, there's like a no tolerance for that. You know, it's like, here, I'm, here I am as a 15 year old being like, yeah, mom and dad, no tolerance. You can't do any of that. Like, you know, and, yeah. and obviously like, I didn't know any better. Um, but yeah, I think it was just like, I think because it's just so ingrained in Indian culture that it's like you know, it's like most, I mean, if you kind of just like, if you look at the Indian community as a whole, right. And you look at, especially like Indian kids, you, I mean, a lot, most Indian kids are raised very education focused. They're very, very family oriented, um, have, you know, a good head on their shoulders. Like it's, you know, so it's like, and I felt like, my parents doing that. Like, I was like, I'm just, I'm not going to be that person I want to be. So it's like, if my parents like, you know, cause I was like, I want to be an Indian kid. Like I want to be that Indian daughter. Who's like, well-educated comes from like a solid rock family. Like, you know, I'm like, I want all of these things into place. And so it's like, with my parents getting divorced, it's like, I'm like, you're making me lose a part of myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, but it's like at 15 years old, I'm like, you don't know who you are, you know? Um, but at the time I like, obviously I thought I knew who I was and, um, and I kind of let, I mean, and even now, I mean, my family is, I'm so, so close to my family. And so it's like family for me was everything. Um, and so, and I guess a lot of it just comes from also just being an only child, like that, that is your foundation and like, that is your rock, you know? So it's like, what do you do when you don't have that foundation? I'm like, my, my entire belief system was just shattered. Like I didn't know what was real in my life anymore at all. Right. Um, so, and it's, it's scary. Yeah. Is there, is there a stigma, whether, you know, in Indian culture or maybe with your religious beliefs, whatever they they might be, is there, is there a stigma of talking about what you're going through, your feelings, maybe issues you're having at home with other people? You kind of mentioned like, look, what we're going through stays inside these walls. Is there a stigma of going outside those walls asking for help? Yes. It's like embarrassing. Um, you know, when my, um, like in high school, I mean, none of my friends knew what was happening in my house. Um, like I, I was always one of those like people in high school where like my reputation, like if, if you ask anyone I went to high school with and it's like, Oh, like, how would you, what is like, how would you like describe Nishima's reputation? And it's all just the same, like oh my gosh, like this super like bubbly, happy social butterfly friends with everyone. Like that, that is who I was in high school, you know? Um, and my friends had no idea that I would literally come to school and put on a show for eight hours and literally just go home and cry every single day because I did not have a family I was coming home to. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was in college where I needed like, you know, so when I was in college, um, all of those, all of those attributes about me, like I was not a social butterfly in college. I completely, I was shut down completely. Um, cause I, I literally found out about my parents' divorce right at the beginning of college. Yeah. And, you know, so it's like, I didn't care to make new friends. All I wanted were my childhood friends. Cause I'm like, you guys are the only ones that can understand me. And like, I can possibly talk to, um, and it's like, I couldn't talk to other Indian kids because 
no other Indian kid was kind of going through what I was going through. Um, and I already felt like I couldn't relate to other Indian kids. So now that I have, I'm coming from a divorced family, it's like, now I definitely don't relate to any of you guys. Mm. And so, you know, so like my childhood friends were really my backbone to help me get through it. I mean, really a lot of the reason why I was able to get through it were because of those childhood friends. Um, so yeah. So see what, you know, watching your parents go through this, has this, I'm sure it has, but I'm curious to know how, has this shaped your view on marriage or relationships in general, whether it's, you know, for yourself or just as a whole? Yeah. Uh, no, it, it definitely has. Um, you know, now like, you know, both of my parents are remarried now. Um, oh, and wow. yeah, they're both remarried and, um, you know, it's, uh, like, Watching your Indian dad date for like the first <laughs> time, it's like the weirdest, just most like, I'm, oh God, like just the things I have seen my dad. I'm like, dad, like, I just, let me walk you through this a little bit. You know, I'm like, as a woman. He's swiping like, right on Tinder. <laughs> I just, you know, like Indian Tinder. It's just like, I don't, you know, I don't know. And I'm like, at this point, I mean, what? I think the first time that my dad, <laughs> I think, oh my God. Um, when my parents had separated for those six months in high school, um, I think that was the first time that my dad ever brought someone home. And I was like, what are you? I literally came home, like walked into the garage and there's just like this white lady sitting on my couch, like watching my childhood videos with my dad. And I'm like, what the, like, who are you? Oh, and I was like, yeah, this is not like, no, I was like, you need to leave now. And after that, never again. Um, yeah. I didn't sign off on this. <laughs> yeah. It was like, I, I guess my dad wasn't expecting me to come home. Like, I don't know. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and then when I was in college, um, you know, my dad, he, you know, he had, uh, he had met someone, you know, like just all Indian people. Like, so there was like one, you know, there was a woman in the Indian community who was also divorced and, you know, so like one of our, like my, so her and my dad had a mutual friend and he was like, Oh, you're divorced. You're divorced. You guys just, you know, be together. And it's like, that's not like, just because that person is divorced doesn't mean that they're like a good, like fit for right. my, like they're the right partner for my dad. Yeah. And so, you know, so that was sort of like the first big long-term relationship that I had seen my dad in and it was for a whole year, but it's like me as an outsider, it's like, I could see so many of these red flags and I was like, oh my gosh, like, no, this could like, this is not the right, this is not the right person for my dad. And I'm, I, and I'm saying this as a 21 year old at this point. You know, yeah. and so, um, and it was very hard. Like, you know, my my dad would not really listen to what I had to say because he was like, "I'm protecting this at all costs," and obviously that makes sense because at that point he's like 50 years old and he wants to just settle down. Like, he wants to just live his life with someone, you know. Right. Um, right. But I was like, "Oh, like I can tell this is bad news," um, and you know, it ended up being bad news. And um, I actually, uh, this is like crazy, but. Um, you know, my, my dad, uh, proposed to her at his 55th birthday, oh, uh, wow. did not tell me. And I was like, have we not learned oh, yes. <laughs> I like, like the secrets? <laughs> like why? Like, I just, have we not like talked about this? And, you know, and I, I mean, I went like, I mean, excuse my language, literally went ape shit in front of everybody at my dad's birthday, yeah. um, because I was not happy. And, um, yeah. And about like a week and a half later, um, I had this like huge, like five to six hour conversation with my dad about it. And I, I called off the engagement. Um, you have that power. Shit. I, <laughs> yeah. My dad, like I, my dad was like, I was like, dad, like you like, no, like if like, this is going to like destroy us if you get into this marriage. Um, and he finally, like he also, cause I think at that point, my dad had also started to realize some red flags. Yeah. Um, and you know, so that the engagement was broken off. Um, and then, Whoa. yeah. Um, and then like about like six or seven months later, um, you know, my dad met, um, my now current stepmom, um, and they've been happily married for about like three years now. Um, but yeah, so and you approved of that one. You signed off on. The yes, yes. No, we love her. Her name is Nikki. Thumbs up. Um, yes, we love, we love Nikki. Um, she's like, 
her, she's, she is like perfect for my dad. Um, perfect. Um, wow. and yeah. And so it's like, so, you know, so like going back to your question, um, I, it's just, it's, you know, like I finally, I finally see what a marriage is supposed to be, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and my, because my dad, he want like, you know, him and my stepmom, like they want, and you know, my stepmom, she also has a daughter, like my stepsister, Um, and they want to set those examples for us because, um, and I, and you know, it's like, I've, I've learned this lesson very recently that when you grow up in a family of chaos and just destruction and no stability, it's like, that is, you just, that is what you like, you're, you just become accustomed to that. So it's like, Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like my parents wanted me to recognize, like, even with my mom and my stepdad, you know, um, like both on both sides, it's they like they 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 want me to see what stability is, yeah, um, and what it means to be in a healthy marriage, um, in a healthy yeah. partnership. Like that's what I like. I just love about like my story is because my parents are now my best friends in the world. And you know, it's and back then it's like. I was holding on to this whole, like, you know, picture perfect, like world of us, because I was like, that's my mom and my dad. But now it's like, that's my mom and my dad, but those are also human beings, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, yeah, like now it's just like, so fun. I mean, yeah, now me and my dad, we like talk about love and partners and relationships and like, you know, and he'll always just kind of guide me into like, you know, the kind of person that he wants me to be with and like what things that I need to be looking out for. And like, um, you know, so it's, I don't know, it's like really, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. It's nice that they didn't let the pressure of staying together at all costs get to them because obviously your experience being raised in that environment would have been very different. You would have probably never seen your parents happy ever. No. And now and you I get have... to see them happy and you obviously have a bigger family now, which is really yeah. cool. And that's how um, I feel as well. Yeah. I mean, and it definitely, I mean, they like, you know, it's this whole experience. I mean, it's, it, it taught me to be very open-minded um, and it taught me just, I don't know, the importance of just vulnerability and like, um, and I don't know it, it, um, and I'm, I'm so, I think what I'm like, just so thankful for is like, and I'm like, I don't know what my mom and dad, I'm like, but you guys did something right. Because, um, it, I'm just so glad that it, it didn't, it didn't harden me, you know, like I've, mm-hmm. I've always had a very, like, I'm a very sensitive person. Um, and I've a very, very soft heart. And I think that's like the one thing I've probably been most proud of is that like, I didn't let it change me for the worse. Um, you know, I, I, I did right. struggle with suicidal depression for two years. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, and that was like a very lonely time period for me. And, and I did, you know, I, I do remember like, I, I pushed a lot of people away. Um, and, uh, because I, you know, I was like, no one is going to understand what I'm going through. Um, and was that was that after, after you found out about your parents? Uh, yeah. Like during college. Oh. Um, Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and like, uh, the summer of 2013, I mean, that was sort of just like, it was like, I think it's like, I I don't know. I'm like, God was like really looking out for me because that summer, um, you know, I, I had gotten accepted to an internship program in Los Angeles for the whole summer. Um, and so, uh, it was like, I literally from like the beginning of June to the first week of August, I was going to be out in LA. It was the first time I was like leaving home, um, in so long. And, um, you know, I like came out to LA, um, the internship I got was at this like production office on the Warner brothers lot. And it was kind of my, like, you know, so it's like when you're like, and I was 20, 20 years old and it's like to be 20 years old and to be in LA for a whole summer. And like, you go to work every day and you're just seeing like the Batmobile driving around Warner, but it's like, <laughs> yeah. you're like in a dream and you're like, Oh my God, like there's so much more to life. And I think yeah. that is when I realized I was like, Nishima, like life is way too big for you to be stuck on this. Like you're mm-hmm. done with depression. Like I'm done with it, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, I just, I just like that, just that summer, it changed for me. I'm curious to know, How old were your parents when they met and how long were they together before they got married? Um, my parents literally met the day of their wedding. Um, (laughs) Okay. That's I was curious. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so my parents, like their, their families had met. Okay. um, And then, you know, my, um, so 
actually very interesting. Um, I actually just asked my mom this question like, like two weeks ago. And I asked her, I was like, mom, like, why did you not like, uh, why didn't you say anything about, um, not wanting to marry dad before the wedding? And she was like, well, I couldn't, um, you know, she was like, I was 18 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, and at that time, like in India, um, and I, I don't know if it's that way now. I think, I don't think it's this way anymore. I mean, maybe in like some of the more super conservative parts, but, um, you know, she was like, if I had said, if we had denied, uh, the wedding, um, essentially my mom's name would have been tarnished and nobody would have wanted to marry my mom. So going into an arranged marriage and then, so just no choice, no choice to even say, no, I'm going to hold off. Why don't you let's wait. And then maybe next year we'll do an arranged marriage. There was no (laughs) option of any kind for your mom. No option of any kind. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah. Um, you know, so my mom, she got married to my dad and she was 18. I think my dad was 25. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, you know, then she came to America, like just came to this brand new country, um, had me when she was 21 years old. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, you know, and her and my dad, they just kind of like stuck it through. And I think, um, but, you know, I I think as I was getting older, I just, they're like, I, I remember like the, and I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, I came home from, I was like, I I was like hanging out with some friends or something. And I came home and my mom was just like in tears, uh, just crying in the bedroom. And I was like, and I'm like 14 years old and I'm like, what's going on? Like, I I've never seen my mom like this before. And like, that's when my mom told me that like, that's when I realized that, you know, my mom was also suffering from suicidal depression. And I think even now, like my parents, a lot of the conversations that me and my parents have been having now is, um, how is this, how is this now affecting me as an adult? Um, Mm -hmm. because now that I've, you know, like I'm at this place of like emotional, like I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm 28. I have a level of emotional maturity. That's like fully pretty well developed. And, um, you know, but it's, uh, it's like, it's interesting. Cause it's like, yeah, it's the way that you view yourself and the way that you approach relationships in your life. It all kind of starts from the way that you were brought up, you know? Right. And so right. it's like, I'm just, I'm just so glad that I like, I know what love looks like. Um, you know, and yes. I, I know what it looks like and I see what it, I see what it feels like. And I see, I see it right in front of me and it's just like, you know, so it's nice. Cause it's like, okay, I know what I want, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. yeah. And your parents were able to give that to you, even if it wasn't with each other, which is really fascinating. I have a couple more questions just about the arranged marriage yeah. situation, if that's okay. Cause yeah. obviously this is not the norm, you know, in, in my culture, my family, um, Did your dad have a choice? Would he have had a choice to call off the wedding or not get married? Or was he in a similar position? I think him and my mom were sort of in the same position. Um, um, I think my, my dad's parents were just, they just, they wanted to see my dad married. Mm -hmm. And so my dad was like, okay, like if you guys found a girl and you approve of the family, cool, let's do it. I don't know. And it's, it is like sad. I mean, I think my dad actually grew to like really love my mom. Um, and you know, and, and even now, like they both, they both do, I mean, it definitely took a couple of years, but like now they will both acknowledge, um, uh, at least it's like to me, they, they will acknowledge the good qualities that they both had in one another, you know? Mm-hmm. I know you you mentioned that your your dad grew to love your mom. Have you ever talked about your parents, whether individually or together, about did they, of course, I'm sure they have an immense amount of love to, for each other. They had you together, all of that. Did they ever develop like romantic in love type of feelings, being that, that that's not how their relationship started? No. No. Uh, no. Uh, no, it was always just more of... um. um I think my, I think from my dad's side, it was, uh, it was romantic. I think mm-hmm. from my mom's side, it was more of like, uh, um, like you're just, um, like I have your back, like you have my back, yeah. I have your back. Um, but it was no, no romance. Um, and so, yeah. And you know, and, and so that's where for me, it was like, 
really hard because um, I kind of started to, and I'm and I'm learning now that um, I'm like, okay, Nishima, you know what you deserve now um, because I started to believe that, like, also I just feel like Indian people too, or Indian people are just like not very good with romance. <laughs> um, like they're just not like, they're very, like, I don't, I don't know, but they're like, they're just like the way that Indian people show affection towards one another. It's like, there's just different ways. I think actually, I actually don't even want to like, I don't even want to just contain it to Indian people. I really think like immigrant families, the way that they show love is not through like touch. Mm-hmm. Um, they show love through, it's like through food, through, you know, it's like through different ways. Like acts of service, like the five acts love of, languages, yes. acts of service, number yes. one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think honestly, I think for most Indian people, I mean, that goes for me too. Like my, I know my love language is acts of service, mm-hmm. um, you know? And so, and yeah. And, um, but I, I didn't know, like, I, and I just, I never really knew that I was also deserving of like of romance you know, um, I, I, I didn't, I just, I didn't think that that's what I was supposed to, like, I just didn't think I, not that I didn't deserve it, but did that. I just, that I didn't need it. I just thought I didn't need it, you know? Um, but I was like, no, I, I want it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, as a woman, knowing that your mom did not have a choice of, you know, who she was going to marry when she was going to marry. And now you, this next generation, you have a lot of choices i'd imagine a lot of options what does that feel like you and is think. that a lot of pressure <laughs> <laughs> you would think um i like, like yeah i've been in la for like what almost four years now not going very well la um, is rough for dating to be fair <laughs> yeah i'm just like nishima just it is a-okay uh, um, but is, it, is that a lot of pressure like i i have to pick the right person and because like my parents didn't even get to pick their person. Is there any of that? Or are they just like, listen, we just want you to be happy and yeah, do what's best um, for you. Yeah. That's all it is. My parents, you know, it's like, I'm not pressured to, to, um, be with an Indian person. Um, I, my parents are very, very open-minded in that sense. Um, my parents are just like, we just want you to be happy. Like mm-hmm. we want you to do all the things for yourself that like we didn't get to do. Um, you know, and so, um, yeah. And, but, you know, but there's also just a part of me that's kind of like, you know, this like little fear of just being like a millennial in this generation. Like, I just feel like the way that people date and I I, I'm like, this is where I'm like, I'm still a traditionalist because, you know, like I am not one, like I am not made out for the dating apps. Like I will never touch a dating (laughs) app. Um, I like, was your dad really on like Indian Tinder? Is that a thing? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's called, um, it's called shop. So, uh, shabby translates to, um, wedding okay. um, or, like, marriage, so, marriage. So it's like marriage.com. So it's shabby.com. Oh <laughs> so it's like a very, like a very famous, like marriage website in the Indian community. So yeah. So that's how my dad and Nikki found each other. Oh my gosh. I love it. Um, hot plug. So, Yeah. So, but you know, so it's like, for me, it's like, I mean, yeah, it's just, I'm like, I'm too much of a traditionalist. So it's like, for me, this sounds like horrible to say, but I'm like, for me, I would much rather be alone than ever, ever make an online profile for myself. Like I, and that is where I'm like, so glad that my parents have taught me how to be independent because I'm just like, honestly, I am a okay without a man. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, um, so no, I mean, my parents are very like, yeah, I mean, they just want me to be happy. I mean, truly, I I really do think I have like two of just like the best parents in the world. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And, you know, you kind of mentioned that, um, you know, some of the Indian kids you were growing up, you know, whether in the same community, same school, whatever that might have been, um, that you couldn't relate because maybe their household felt a bit more strict or in certain areas, What are some things you absolutely love about Indian culture? As much as I've grown up not feeling like I can relate to my community, um, there's just something about, I just, I love the way that Indian people take people in as if they're their own family. Um, You know, no one is, um, you don't treat people like a stranger. Um, You know, it's like, even what, like, even if I have like friends coming over and they have friends that are coming over, it's like, I want, let me take care of you. Like, let me feed you. Let me like, what can I do? You know? And, and I love that just 
that deep sense of hospitality that is so ingrained in Indian culture. I love that so much. And like, and even in being in a place like LA, I mean, the, the few Indian friends I have out here, I mean, immediately they feel like home, you know, because I'm like, you, you get it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah. And, you know, and obviously like outside of just like the wedding and, you know, the weddings and like all the drinking, yeah. that we do, um, <laughs> like the dancing, you know, yeah, all that's that some good stuff. stuff, good parties. For- <laughs> yeah. Um, but I just, I, I really, I love the way that we, we, we treat people, we, we treat people very well. And, um, I just think, you know, it's, and especially in like Western culture, um, people don't, I, I kind of just find that Indian people kind of look out for people in a way that, um, you don't really see in a lot of Western society. You know, it's interesting. I, you know, I don't have a ton of experience, but I have been, I was a religious studies major in college. So I had gone to several different types of, um, you know, like religious spaces and stuff, you know, I was studying whether it was for a class or just because out of curiosity and my favorite experience was going to, um, basically, uh, uh, if I remember how to say it, so, uh, Guru Dharwa, like a, a Sikh temple, Um, and it was the warmest experience I have ever had in any kind of religious setting. And it made such an impact on me that I really wanted to, um, learn more about it. I wanted to go to India and live there. And I remember how, um, how they incorporated so much in their scripture. It was like, it was like from all different types of religions they were bringing into yeah. one. And I loved that. And then afterward, I got to go to the Lungar, which I think is what it's called. Um, where basically they, they told us that every, everybody in their community takes a turn feeding the whole community like once a year. So you only have to do it once a year, but you are fed every single week together as like this big family. And I just, that was, I loved that. I, I hadn't had an experience like that. And I had, I I've, I've was raised in a couple other traditions yeah. and, um, and I'm not trying to knock anybody's traditions, but, um, I felt like that warmth that you were talking about versus, you know, I've been in some very uh, colder spaces, you know, when yeah. it, when it comes to the certain practices and it was such a huge difference. Um, and that really, really definitely Im- impacted me, uh, very yeah. much. So yeah. I feel like growing up, like, you know, I feel like, um, just a lot of American fam, like even just little things to where it's like, um, if you have a, like, I feel like there's been times where, um, you know, uh, like for example, if I wanted to go to like a friend's house who's not Indian, um, and like, you know, their parents would be like, sort of like, oh, they can come over after dinner. Or they can, you know, and, but it's like for mm-hmm. Indian people, it's like, oh, do they want to come have dinner with us? Yeah. Or, you know, and it's like very, just like, it's just very like, yeah, like whatever, the more, the merrier, like, let's all just, you know, um, and, and like, I just, that's what I, I, I don't know. I just, I love that. I love that so much. And like, and you know, I, I didn't really grow up my, neither of my parents are religious in any way. Um, uh, my dad is not, he's not really like a, um, but you know, but I think for both my parents, they've always you know, the two things that my parents have always taught me is like Nishima, like we don't, you don't need to be a religious person, but you do need to be a good person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that's my, that's sort of my dad's thing is like, you don't like my dad's kind of like, I don't care about religion, but what I do care about is, are you a good person? Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and my mom, it's like, she's kind of like, just always like Nishima, like you always want to go to sleep with a peace of mind, knowing that like your hands are always clean you know, and that like, you're always just be good and just be good, be kind. And like, even when you don't want to be kind, be kind, yeah, you know, just do the right thing. Just nope, always no do the what. right thing. Yeah. You yeah. know? Um, and so, yeah. So it's like crazy because it's like, even though my parents like never really knew how to like love each other, like in a romantic way, like they taught me a lot about just how to love people. Are there any misconceptions people have? I don't know this. We're making a lot of like general statements, Indian culture, obviously that definitely varies. I even talk to people that, you know, Northern India and Southern India can be very different of certain practices yeah, and stuff, sure. but is there any, are there any misconceptions people have about, uh, Indian culture or maybe specifically the culture that you grew up in? I know specifically, like at least working in Hollywood, um, you know, I've, I've like literally hit my breaking point in terms of just Indian representation and like what we've, what we've 
gotten on television. It's like little things and there's like, yeah. there's like small things and there's just like larger scale things. I mean, you know, I think obviously like first and foremost, I think it's just, and I think, again, I think this goes for a lot of just like, like just a lot of Asian um, focused families, but that, um, you know, we're not one that's just kind of the big one. Like, you know, we are not all the stereotypes of being doctors, engineers, and lawyers, you know, um, and that, you know, yeah. and I think a lot of our, especially in the way that it's been portrayed in like American media, um, you know, I, I'm just kind of like, we're so much more than just like, we're like so much more than like these grand weddings. And we're so much more than, you know, um, I don't know, these stereotypes that they play, that they play into on television, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. there's a rich, rich history of India and there's a lot of layers to who we are. And, you know, and I think, and that's, I think that's why for me, it's like so important for me to like, you know, I'm like so determined to sell my story as a television show, because it's like, for me, I, I've been waiting to see like, what does it look like when an Indian family is going through trauma, you know? And like, what does it look like when an Indian family, like what is pain in Indian culture, you know? Um, And I just, I don't feel like there's, I I just, I don't feel like that's been hit yet. And, and it hasn't been given sort of the justice that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, man, I'm sure there's like probably so many that I'm missing, um, but that kind of, and, and yeah. And, and I think also, you know, again, it's just kind of the big ones of just, you know, like there, there is like North Indian and there's South Indian and there's like so many different languages and so many different cultures that like, we're not all the same, mm-hmm. um, you know? And so, um, and I think the big one that I would like to say is that we don't speak Indian. Uh, Indian is not a language. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. <laughs> Do you want to kind of expand on basically, um, Indian representation in the media, what would you like to bring to the table? And, you know, what kind of gaps would you like to close? I think the thing is, is I want the fact of being, I want the fact of being Indian to be secondary to what the story is. Like, for example, like with my story, you know, it's like, I feel like what makes what I went through so relatable is like, it's not that like the fact that we were Indian was just a very, that's like secondary to the story. It's the fact Mm -hmm. that like, it's just, it's the lie and it's the pain. And it's like the, just that, 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 that like yearn for just to be happy, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and that's something that everybody can relate to, yeah. um, you know? So I think, I think that's my thing. I think it's just, um, to create things that are not just like, you don't have to be Indian to understand like what a character is going through. Like, yeah, it's a part of, it's a part of who they are, but it's not the whole thing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing about all that. I have one last question, then we'll get into a little self-care segment. Okay. Um, if somebody listening right now, um, it, you know, they're, they're maybe in a similar situation that you used to be in, maybe their parents, um, are not doing well. They're from an Indian family. They feel super alone. They don't know who to talk to about it because maybe nobody else is experiencing that same yeah. thing. What would you tell them? Um, I think one, I would tell them that they're not alone. Um, and that I think the most important lesson I've learned from my experience that I would want other people, if there are other Indian kids that are kind of going through what I've gone through, um, is that, you know, the, the world around you is just kind of like the world is as it is right? Like what's happening around you is, is as it is the only thing, the only thing that's changing is the way that you move through it. So you have to decide how do you want to move through it? Right. And so I think, and I think that's my, I think that's just the biggest thing. It's like, you know, if, especially like being an only child, um, I had to ask myself like, okay, Nishima, like, where do you want to, where, where do you want to end up on the other side of this? Um, and you know, so I was like, so you, you, you have to make those changes for yourself and in a, in a way that's going to like, almost like you have to look out for you. Um, and yeah, I I think if that, if that makes any sense, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, Yeah. I think it's, yeah. And I think it's also, it's just, um, to, to don't be scared to be open about it, even if no one understands, but just you, you got to talk about it, you know? And I think that's just, I, you know, after I wrote that Huffington Post article, I mean, even 
even now I'm like kind of blown away by just like, I, I still, I mean, I wrote that article in 2015 and it's like oh, six wow. years later, I'm still getting messages from people about it. And, um, you know, actually a message I got a couple of months ago, um, was from the South Asian, like another South Asian girl. And she was like, Nishima, like after I read this, like it made me feel like I've been feeling so lonely and this made me feel so not alone. And it was like the most, mm. and like, I'm like, that's, and I'm like, that's all I can do is like, I don't want people to feel like they're alone. You know, it's yeah. like, you're never alone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being yeah. such an open book about all of this. Seriously. Of I, I feel like I've, I've learned so much from you and thank you for coming on. And then, yeah, we'll just kind of wrap it up with um, how do you like to practice self-care? Is there a certain thing that you enjoy doing for yourself when you're stressed um, or just in general? Um, <laughs> well, I have like a really weird, uh, so I have a bunny. Um, I have a pet bunny. Oh, you do? Um, oh, yeah. And so, <laughs> um, and so I'm like, I'm honestly probably like the only one I've ever met. That's like, ups- I have a very weird obsession with bunnies. <laughs> um, but he is, I mean, he is like my like everyday daily, like self care. Um, oh my gosh. I love that. Yeah. I know if he was like hopping around right now, I would have grabbed him, oh but gosh, I think he's under my so bed. Cute. Oh. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> yeah, he's the best. Um, but, um, honestly, I just love to date. like you're a girl with the, just Give me a cup of vodka water with some lemon, <laughs> with some, I just need some Latin music and that's all I need. Like that is self-care for me all the time. I love it. Yeah. Drink and a dance. Drink and a dance. That's oh, all. That's I great. Need. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but, yeah. I feel like I have so many, I have so many, like, oh God, I just, I have, I have so many hobbies that I do. Like I'm, I'm also like an avid, like, go, like, I've been like training at the gym for like six years now. So it's like, that's like, just like a part of my lifestyle now. I mean, I love cooking, love, love, love cooking. Um, yeah. And I feel like a lot of my self-care is just also like cooking for my friends and like feeding my nice. friends. Like I love doing that. So I don't know, nice. just any, I, I have so many interests. Like it's, it's very hard for me to get bored with myself. <laughs> Hey, that's good. Especially during quarantine. That's a good place to be. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Well, um, would you like to, where can people find you or continue this conversation or just send a message saying thank Um, you? No, they can. uh, Yeah. uh, My Instagram, um, they can, you know, if they ever need to talk, they can happily message me. Um, My Instagram handle is it's Nishima Gupta um, with the underscore after it. Okay. Um, and yeah. And I mean, if they're ever, if they're interested in just reading any of my work on Huffington Post, um, yes. you can just Google me. Um, Perfect. But like Huffington Post, Nishima Gupta. And I think like all my things will show up. What was the the title of the article about your parents' divorce? Uh, it was, um, was my like? Indian parents got divorced and it was the best thing that happened to us. Oh, <laughs> Love it. Okay, everybody, go read that. That's fantastic. Uh, well, Nishima, thank you so much. And uh, I'll be you. texting you for some bunny photos in a second. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I would. I'm happy to share. Uh, he has many nudes. Um, <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Have a good rest of, of the day. Talk Bye. soon. Bye bye. How great was Nishima? That was awesome. I learned so much. She was such a blast. Thank you again, Nishima, for coming on the show. And I just want to wrap up with the iTunes review of the episode. This is from Ail212121. And it says, new favorite podcast. I recently started listening to podcasts and I have found my new favorite. You girls are hysterical and helpful. I even started to clean my corners since listening to the feng shui episode. I'm a few hundred episodes behind, but I'll catch up eventually. Thank you so much, Ale. Or I hope it's Ale. It could be something different. I'm so sorry. Either way, thank you for leaving that review and taking the time to do that. If you want to leave a review, you can head over to iTunes and your review might get read on the next episode of Self Helpless. You can also leave a review wherever you listen to the show as well. And that is it for today, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode and we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Self Helpless Podcast. You can find our Patreon community, merch, and our individual work at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you shared this episode with a friend or feel free to post it on Instagram and tag at selfhelplesspodcast so we can repost you and say thank you. 